Good morning. I'm going to tell you a story. It's not a story that I created, it's a story I read in the Bible. It's uh, one that Jesus told. I'm only going to tell you part of the story. Some of you might know it, some of you it might be new. I'm going to change the words a little bit, but here's how the story goes. Once upon a time, there was a boy who lived in a sort of nice house. But he didn't have enough Game Boy games, he didn't have enough Wii games, he didn't have enough friends. His house was good, but it was far away from everybody else, and he was lonely. He had an older brother, but the older brother didn't really like to play with him, because the younger brother always complained. My house isn't nice enough. I'm not living close enough to friends. People at school don't like me. All that kind of stuff. So as he got older, he had an idea. He said to his dad, I don't like living here. I want to move out. I want to go someplace else. I want to live my own way. And so dad, give me money so I can go. The dad said, well, I don't think you should go. The son said, I want to go. Dad said, I think you should stay. The son said, I want my money. Dad's like, fine, take your money, go. And so the son took the money. And he went out and he bought a really cool house. He bought a huge screen TV. He bought every game he could and he had parties all the time. He had tons of friends, tons of pizza parties, tons of everything. And then his money ran out. He's like, oh, hmm. He lost his house. He lost his games. He lost his friends. And he had nothing to do. So he went looking for some work, and no one would hire him. But one person said, hey, if you want to go and feed my pigs, you can do that for free. The guy's like, well, it's better than having no place to live. So he went and lived with the pigs. And he fed the pigs food. He looked at the pigs and said, these are my only friends. At least at home with my dad, I had a bed. I had clean clothes. I had food. People that work for my dad have more than I do. I think I'm going to go home. Now, do you think his dad would be excited to see him or not? Do you think he'd be in trouble? Do you think he might be grounded? Do you think dad would say, that's it, you get no more games, you get no more TV, you get nothing? That's what he's afraid of. Would you be in trouble if you treated your mom and dad that way? Maybe. Here's what happened. So the kid kind of decides I should go home. So he starts heading home. His dad sees him. And the dad was so excited that he was coming home that he ran out to meet him. He said, your clothes kind of stink. Maybe you should shower up. Let's put some new clothes on you. Let's clean you up. You look a little skinny. Let's give you some food. You can have your old room back. You can have your old TV back. You can have all your stuff back. I'm just glad you're home. Is that a pretty cool dad? That dad's kind of like God. That dad is God. Jesus told the story to say sometimes we want more than what we have. We want more friends. We want a bigger house. We want cooler clothes. We want a better looking nose. We want straighter teeth. We want whatever we want. And we get all pouty if we don't get it. It's not fair. Have you ever said that? It's not fair? Hmm. God says, you know what? In my house... I got lots of stuff to give you. If you're just happy with what I give you, you'll be much happier in this life. Not thinking about what somebody else has. Maybe they have a smaller nose. Maybe they have straighter hair. Maybe they have a bigger screen TV. Maybe they have more games. Be happy with what you have. And that's where true happiness comes. And the dad that took that boy home said, I love you, and I am so glad you're back. Even if we start pouting sometimes, and don't like what God is doing. Maybe we get angry at our parents. God always says, you know what? I forgive you. And I want you to always be home with me. I'm going to talk to more of your moms and dads about that so they can explain more of that. When you go to children's church or listen to the message, you'll get some more ideas on how that works. The idea is we are happy with what God gives us. So let's fold your hands and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, help me realize you give me Everything I need. Amen.
Okay, if you go to Children's Church, you may go. If you go back to your parents, you may go. All of you may go, and I'm going to stay up here. Thank you. We're in Lent. The color is purple. As we travel through Lent, we're looking about how we can, or talking about how we can join the crowd. A blessed crowd, a debt-free crowd. Today, an honored crowd. Honor. It's an interesting word. We kind of think about what does that mean to be honored. When you look at Webster, just the dictionary, it says to have respect or to be respected. To have a good reputation or to display good behavior. I think sometimes we forget what true honor is. It's that respect. It's that reputation. It's that, that good behavior. We're going to get to how that applies to us in just a few minutes. We're looking at the epistle, Ephesians, today. Paul is writing to a church that kind of needs to deal with some of this, and he lays the foundation early on in his letter to the Ephesians about honor and what does that that mean. Paul really takes the story of the prodigal son, the parable, and redoes it in a way that's for uh, grown-ups in this first part of Ephesians. It really is his theology, his teaching in a, in a different level on prodigal son stuff. If you recognize that story as Jesus' parable, here it comes again in a different direction. So I have to ask you, are you living your dream Is life great? And you're like, I have gusto. I've got it all. I love where life is at. It is great. Are you living the dream? Yeah. Okay, so a few yeses, a few not exactly. A few like, I don't even want to talk about it because my life is horrible right now. Because there's always something that you can want, something you envision that you don't have. There's always some kind of gold ring you're trying to grab, and it's just out of your reach. Kind of like that prodigal son, kind of like any of us. My house isn't close enough to friends. My house isn't big enough. My body isn't just right. My income isn't the right level. My friends aren't the right kind of friends. Whatever that is, we can always want something more. And if I just had that, then I've got the dream. Until I have it, and then my dream changes, and I want more. We don't grow out of that. We just grow into masking it better and better as we get older and older. It's something that we're born with. It's in our DNA. Enough isn't enough ever if we have the wrong type of honor and dream in our life. And so the question is, where do we get our our dreams from? Who do we compare ourselves to to say you don't have enough? Because if we compare to neighbors, to communities, to, to neighboring churches, whatever that is, if we begin to compare what we have with those around us, it's going to lead us down to envy and coveting and maybe even lusting, which is, I want it and I have to have it. I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to stop until I get it. We can lust after all kinds of things, envy after all kinds of things, covet all kinds of things because we're trying to accomplish our dream. It's my right. I deserve it. I'm entitled. Living there is a pretty hollow life. It led the prodigal son right into a pig pen when all that he had dreamed of and all that he'd hoped for fell to pieces. It's the same for us as well. When we seek to bring respect and honor into our lives, look what I've accomplished, look where I live, look what I've done, look at what I drive, look at the size of my TV, look at me, that dream is really pretty shallow. And at any moment, the bottom can fall out of that dream because it's all about you. You're living in the wrong space, you're living in the wrong house. Paul in Ephesians says you need to change your residence. You need to change your address. And here's how he begins to teach that to the Ephesians and to teach us as well. Ephesians 2.1, it ends with we're dead. Let's just get that straight. We're dead. The dreams that you have, the direction you have, grabbing all those gold rings here, it just leads to to being dead. If you don't feel dead, just keep going because you will. You're not going to feel better. Try to grab it, try to fill it in, try to backfill. It's going to, at some point, you're going to feel dead. Good. Now you're in a good place to start this recovery process. 
You were dead in which you once walked, the ways you lived, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. When you begin to walk and desire those things that are only earth-bound, and you begin to compare, do I have that which other people have? Do I look the same? Do they treat me the same? Am I respected the same? Are we walking in that path? That path is only filled by the prince of the power of the air, which is not Jesus. We're living in a house built and occupied and surrounded by Satan and his desires for you, which is death. If your dreams are only earthbound, you're going to work yourself to death to get them, and all you're going to get is death. That's what Paul lays out here. Dead. You're going to always follow something. We don't have it in us not to follow something. When this Lenten series talks about joining the crowd, it's because you can only do that. You can only join the crowd. You are not a little God yourself to recreate yourself in your own image. You can only follow an image that's in front of you. There's no way to do it other ways. There are heretics early in the church that said you can do it yourself. They are wrong. You can only follow something ahead of you. And you're either going to follow that of this world, which is the prince of this air, or you're going to follow Jesus. Because you're going to follow something, and you're going to take that image and be created in that image. There's no neutral ground here. It's either world or Jesus. Paul lays out here that the people of Ephesians have to be careful because they started out following the way of the world. There's no other way that we know. That's what we know. And yet, verse 4 but God. This is where you're headed, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, he enters our life. That's what changes things around. It's the but God shows up in your life. Not that you accomplish the house or the car or the body or the income or whatever, but God shows up wherever you are And that begins to radically change where you are and what you do and what you are striving for. It is by the grace of God that you can think anything different than the way of the world. So God shows up. In whatever pig pen you are in, there is that moment when God shows up and says, your father's house has more than what you have now. In your father's house, there's better living than what you have created God shows up. He enters our life. And all of a sudden we say, what is God's dream for me? What is God's vision for me? Because mine, it's, it's not working so well. He made us alive in Christ. That's the first thing Paul says to the Ephesians. God shows up and he finally makes you alive in Christ. Because as much striving and as hardworking as you were, you were dead before God shows up and makes you alive in Christ. And he raises you up with him and seats you with him in heavenly places. Well, now there's a change of address. From earth to heavenly places. You are occupying heavenly places right now. You may look around and go, that doesn't look like it. Well, Scripture says you're occupying heavenly places. So the person next to you is in heaven as well right now. Oh, that's surprising. No. (laughs) We draw our eyes back to the world as opposed to trusting the truth of Scripture that we are given residence in heaven now. We are occupants of heaven now. We are there because Christ has made us alive and raised us up to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our location has changed. Now, whether we live that or not is the next part of what the epistle is all about. Do we live as if our residence is heaven and we are here on mission? We're not stuck here. We're not trying to get approval here. We are sent by heaven to be here for a purpose so that in the coming ages, 
he might show God his immeasurable riches in his grace and kindness towards us. We are here in this time and space to show how residents of heaven live here. So we can show the immeasurable riches and grace that God has given us and has offered to the world. That's honor. That's where God says, I have filled you with a whole new way of looking at yourself. You're not stuck here on earth. You're on mission here on earth. Your residence is heaven, and you've got a job here, and I trust you enough because of the power of the Spirit to do your job and bring honor to your Father and bring honor to where you truly reside. Heaven, thy kingdom come. We're all about bringing heaven and the glories and riches and forgiveness and grace of heaven here and now to make a difference here. We're not just buying time to get there. We are here fully honored to say, how do we bring heaven here for the sake of those around us to show just what kind of dad we have? I want to speak this phrase to you, and I want you to let it sit into your heart. I'm going to say it five times. One time just so you hear it, and then four more times, because that makes five. Let God honor you. Let God honor you. Which means you allow him into your heart. You allow him to tweak your dreams and plans. You allow him to mold and shape you. Let God have control of your dreams and direction. Not the media, not the world now, not your neighbors, not your employer. Let God, let God honor you. Just yesterday, we were in King Cullen, picking up some groceries. I was looking at a magazine rack, because every few months I buy Men's Health magazine just to get recipes, just to see what exercises, just to look like the guys on the cover, which is not going to happen. <laughs> so I went up to look at it. My world crashed yesterday. Men's Health put Justin Bieber. <laughs> I'm done. Done. If Justin Bieber becomes the image of men's health, I will become unhealthy. <laughs> it's terrified. I walked away, told Michelle, I'm not buying that. Not this month. I don't know when. I, I, my, my life is crushed. <laughs> and yet there's the image. Young guy, rich. Okay, his abs are pretty, pretty strong. But anyway, back to the point. What are we focusing on? What do we lift up as here's the image, here's the ideal, here's the role model that you should follow after, here's how you should look and act and think? Really? Justin Bieber? But it could be anybody. If we begin to say, here's my model, I'm not letting God bring me honor. I'm trying to mold my honor after somebody else. I'm trying to mold my honor after someone I think is cool or rich or smart or whatever. Letting God means my, my dream is different. My image is different. I let God begin to shape me. I let God begin to mold me. I let him do it, realizing that as he brings me honor, as he lifts me up, the person I become is exactly in the image that God wants it to be. And I'm not fighting against anything else. I'm letting God do what God does. Let God honor you. God wants to shape your life and change your life and mold your life. The God that created the world, the God that sent Jesus, God cares about you. God knows you by name. God knows your, your warts and your wrinkles, your fears and your hopes. God knows all that and he still says, I'm here for you. Well, that's pretty good. But God, that's not some little thing. Let God honor you. Let him shape 
mold, change, inspire, direct you. Let God honor you. Let him define respect. Let him define behavior. Let him define your reputation. Maybe you aren't the most cutthroat salesperson. Maybe you don't take the shortcuts. Maybe you do the right thing all the time and it's irritating to somebody. But let God define that reputation. Oh, they're just the people that are Christians and they always do the right thing. Ah, that's so irritating. They lose sales. They drive the speed limit. They don't cuss. They don't cut in line. They, they're just nice people. Hmm. Now there's an idea. Would God create in you someone nice, someone people want to be around, someone who people love and care for because there's a softness and an openness. There's a forgiving spirit and an understanding spirit and a gracious spirit, a spirit that can tolerate some trouble, a spirit that can survive when a snake bites you in the butt like in the Old Testament because you look at Jesus and say, it's not going to take me down. It stings a bit, but I'm not going to die because God has honored you and changed how you define behavior and respect and reputation. It's God's plan, not your plan. And then let God honor you. You do realize that God loves you deeply, right? That God knows you and loves you and has designed you to be unique and to be rich and honored and loved. God knows each of you. And he still likes you. That's really good because he knows you and he's not running away. In fact, he's running towards you saying, come on home. Okay, you smell a bit like pigs. Okay, your clothes are a little tattered. But come on home. I want you home. I want to love you. How often do you think when you're, when you're afraid, when you have medical results that aren't what you want, when you've got bills that you can't pay, when you've got kids that are telling you you're not good enough, when you look around and think, my life isn't where I want it to be, do you stop and think, wow, God still loves me. And that is the anchor I'm plowing into everything. That life may be tough, and it may be not the dream I was hoping, but God has not given up on me. Let God honor you. See, when we gain that true sense of who we are, when we gain the sense that we are citizens of heaven who are here on mission, we are here because it's God's design right now, and we are here until God designs something different. We are on mission to show what it means to be a child of God, loved by God, honored by God, molded by God. Then we begin to change the community. We are strengthened believers when we know our identity is in Christ, and we can transform communities when we realize that it is God that lifts us up. It's God that honors us, and all we do is live for him. Strengthened believers, transforming communities. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may that peace keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. We take opportunity now to bring our tithes and offerings forward.